Well, thank you for joining and clicking on the podcast. I'm your host, Randy Duncan, and we are making our way through the book of Genesis verse by verse. But before we get started today, I just want to thank and appreciate all of you who have listened to previous episodes. And I've not recorded an episode in almost two months now due to moving and remodeling our new home, which is also where my office is located as well as where I record. And in all transparency, I also had a two-week battle with the Rona as well. So thank you to all who have reached out and sent messages asking when the next episode was going to be released because it's been impactful to you or someone you know. Now, we know people are listening to the podcast because we've had listeners now from over 50 different countries and over 700 different cities already in just the first 19 episodes. So I know there's an interest in this type of Bible study, but still, it's always nice to hear from listeners, and I sincerely and I genuinely appreciate your comments, and I'm very excited to also be back on schedule now. Now also, before we get started here in chapter 8, I wanted to correct something that I said in the last episode. I said that Noah took on board the ark more than one pair of the unclean animals so that there would be more for sacrifices, but I should have said that he took on more than one pair of the clean animals for sacrifices, and I just simply misspoke there. And thank you to listener Jess who contacted me and pointed that out. With that said, as a reminder, in the last episode, I threw a lot at you as we covered all of chapter 7. Remember, we discussed Noah and his family boarding the ark along with the animals, and we discussed the extent of the flood. In other words, was it local, was it universal, or was it worldwide? Which brings us now to chapter 8, which will see the flood subside and Noah exit the ark. In chapter 8, verse 1 begins, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were closed. The rain from the heaven was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And that takes us through verse 3. So it says that God, quote, remembered Noah. But that's not remembered in the sense that we use the term in English, where, you know, we recall something that we maybe have forgotten. After all, I mean, this is God we're speaking of. He doesn't forget anything. No, that, that word in Hebrew refers to acting upon a previous commitment to a covenant partner. In other words, God acted on his previous commitment to Noah and so proves himself trustworthy. Verses 4 and 5 read, And in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Now, many people have heard of the search for Noah's ark. I mean, ask anybody familiar with this story, where did Noah's ark land? And they will likely answer that, look, the, the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. But is that right? I mean, is that correct? What does the text actually say? It says that the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Mountains with an S plural, somewhere in that area. Now, the mountains of Ararat constitute an area in modern-day eastern Turkey, southern Russia, and northwest Iran. Those are the mountains of Ararat. Now, there have been many expeditions to find the ark, you know, focused specifically on Mount Ararat or in the mountains of Ararat. And there have been several pictures which have surfaced, you know, purporting to identify the ark sometimes encased in ice, other times just as a shape in the topography resembling a, a rectangular object. I mean, history is full of supposed ark sightings on Ararat. I mean, Marco Polo even referenced it. It has supposedly, you know, been spotted by airline and military pilots flying overhead. I mean, there was even a, a CBS primetime special back in 1993 titled The Incredible Discovery of Noah's Ark. I believe that discovery obviously turned out to be rather spurious. And these expeditions have, have all come up empty-handed thus far. I mean, Mount Ararat is the highest peak in Turkey. It's almost 17,000 feet, and it's snow-covered all year round. The last 300 feet are now solid ice. But some people do believe that the ark will be found in God's timing, maybe 
as a sign of some sort and that it could still be identifiable if it had been protected beneath ice. And we know that Noah covered it with pitch, which would have also served as a layer of protection to perhaps preserve the ark. However, one possibility, and perhaps a very likely one, that people rarely stop to consider is that Noah and his family would have used the ark's wood for building materials once they emerged from the ark. I mean, obviously, the ark was constructed using high-quality wood, so it makes sense that they would have utilized this wood for various purposes. Remember, they're having to start completely over, from scratch. I mean, if I was Noah, that's what I would have done. Verses 6 through 12 read, At the end of forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him, to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth a dove, and she did not return to him any more. Notice in verse 11, the dove came back with an olive leaf. And to this day, the dove and the olive leaf or the olive branch are a symbol of peace and, and of hope and optimism. But I want to take this opportunity to walk down maybe a, a little bit different path and to explore a different perspective concerning the raven and the dove. Now certainly, the raven did not return to the ark because it lived on carrion, which is the decaying flesh of dead animals. The raven would have survived just fine. In fact, it would have had a, a virtual buffet of floating carcasses after the flood. I mean, after the judgment of the flood, there would have been dead carcasses everywhere. The raven liked the things in this judged world, and he feasted on them. But the dove... The dove returned to the ark. When sent forth, the dove finds a world inhospitable to its way of living. So both the raven and the dove are sent forth into a judged world. The raven fits in just fine. In fact, the raven thrives, and so he never returns. The dove, however, doesn't like what it sees, and it returns to the ark. Interestingly, the raven is listed as an unclean bird, the dove as a clean bird. And as J. Vernon McGee has said, the dove went out into the judge world and found no satisfaction, no rest, and so returned to the ark. You see, to some people, the dove represents the believer in this world, one who finds no satisfaction, no rest in this world until we come back to the ark. Remember, like I mentioned in a couple of earlier episodes, there was only one ark and it had only one door. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Notice also that the raven and the dove are in the world together. The clean and the unclean, they're together. As believers, we're told in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride and possessions, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. Now certainly, there are many wonderful things God has provided for us to enjoy in this world, such as you know the, the beauty of nature and, and the beauty of relationships with others. But that's not what we're talking about. This is referencing and speaking to your priorities in life. Are you spending your life attempting to live in and, and conquer the world? I mean, trying to acquire more things to achieve things that this world celebrates? In other words, what are your true priorities in life? How much attention and devotion, how much time do you allow for your relationship with God? Be careful, my friends. Don't become so busy in this world that you slowly squeeze God out of your daily routine and eventually your entire calendar. You know, it's been suggested that we become like the gods we worship. If we worship the world, we'll become like the world. And James 4.4 4 tells us, Do you not know 
that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And again, as John tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Verses 13 through 19 read, In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. Now sometimes people have the idea that Noah was on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights while the rain and the floodwaters came. But that is just simply a gross misunderstanding of Scripture. The text tells us clearly how long Noah and his family were on board the ark. Remember, in verse 11, we're told, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of heaven were opened, and then the rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now when does Noah disembark? Verse 13 tells us, in the 601st year of Noah, on the second month, on the 27th day of the month. Well, what does that mean? That means Noah and his family are on board the ark for just over one year. One year. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, different commentaries arrive at slightly different numbers concerning how long they were on board the ark, but we know it was a little over a year. That's a lot different than 40 days. And when Noah finally steps out, he would have stepped out into an environment that looked much different than the one he knew before he boarded the ark. Now, there are some who have pointed out that, look, if you look at the Jewish calendar dates for when the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat and when Jesus was resurrected, that they occurred on the same date, the 17th of the Jewish month of Nisan. In other words, when you reconcile the two calendars, the religious and civil calendars of old, you can determine that our new beginning on planet Earth occurred on the anniversary in anticipation of our new beginning in Christ. Now, to be clear, I've not researched that. I'm just throwing that out there so that you're aware that that thought and belief is held by some. But if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would encourage you to do your own research. Verses 20 through 22. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Interesting. What's the first thing Noah does when he leaves the ark? He builds an altar to the Lord. Now, this tells you where his heart was. tells you where his mind was at the time. Now, while promising to never again strike down every living creature or curse the ground for man's sake, God also makes an interesting comment. He says, quote, For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. I find that interesting because the world tries to teach us the exact opposite. Trying to teach us and tell us that man is basically good. And then if a person is evil, then there's a reason outside of themselves which caused it. In other words, if someone does evil deeds, it's because they were a victim somehow. They're a victim of society, or they grew up poor, or they've been discriminated against somehow. They've been treated unfairly, or maybe they had a rough childhood. I mean, the list goes on and on. Any excuse you can think of, but never because they were just simply evil. And those who blame these outside societal forces will always encourage people to battle society rather than their own nature. And that, unfortunately, is 
where we seem to be in America right now. Blame evil on anything and anyone else rather than where it truly lies, within the heart of the individual. And here's the concern. As Dennis Prager has said, the most important question that a society that wishes to survive can ask is this. How do we make good people? But societies that believe people are basically good will never ask that question. But in wrapping up this episode in chapter 8, we should heed what the New Testament indicates regarding the flood. That the flood should be a reminder to us of the reality of the final judgment. In the flood, both God's justice and His grace are revealed. In the end, this will be the case where on the day of judgment, God's justice and God's grace will once again be revealed. And I would mention also another time God's justice and His grace, His love, was on display. And that was on the cross, where justice and grace converged. But until then, perhaps we should listen to Peter's advice in 2 Peter 3.11 on how we should live our lives in the meantime. Peter tells us, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you again for your patience during my transition to, again, our new home and office. And I hope you'll join me again next week. Until then, God bless.